Barry, would um, would you please open us in prayer? Yeah, we will do. Father, what a beautiful morning. We thank you for the breath of life, all that you give us. Father, I just pray that you'd bless us during this hour of teaching and uh, you'd open our heart to passivity, which seems to affect a lot of Christians and the, mm. as a result, the church is non-functional. And uh, I just thank you for Lane and just ask that you bless him richly, speak through him to us. Let us learn these principles and let us live a more godly life. And I thank you for each person that's tuned in this morning that we uh, might fellowship together, learn together, and accomplish whatever you'd have, whatever task you'd have us to do on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> All right, we're going to continue with this subject of passivity this morning. Um, and we'll look at several more versions of it before we finish. Um, any of you who've been in the military, you know that it, in combat, when a unit goes into a defensive position, usually at night, they'll always set up a perimeter defense. And the outer ring of this defense is a system that's designed to warn the unit of any approaching enemy. Um, that outer defense often involves a device called a tripwire. Or in today's high-tech battlefield, the, uh, this often includes various electric electrical devices such as scanners and sensors wired to explosives or flares or even laptop computers within the inner per, uh, defensive perimeter. In its most rudimentary form, it may be nothing more than thin wire stretched across uh, some assumed avenue of approach at about ankle height, thus it's called a tripwire. Uh, and there are ration cans containing pebbles to make noise when the wire is disturbed hanging from this wire. And I suppose these, that kind of stuff is gone these days because uh, rations have no longer come in cans. Their, their meals ready to eat come in foil packs. Uh, but the point is that these tripwires are designed to alert the unit of danger and to give them time to react in an appropriate manner. The human conscience is the tripwire of the soul. It is our outer perimeter defense that warns us of issues and even danger and gives us time to react in an appropriate manner. It is our first line of defense against evil. It consists of a set of norms and standards which are usually learned in a protective nurturing environment such as the family and the school and the church, and even at one time on television. One purpose of these institutions is to equip the person with a solid set of norms and standards with which he would become a law-abiding citizen that function within society in a courteous and respectful and moral manner. Traditionally in the United States, these norms and standards are based on Judeo-Christian moral values. They are generally scriptural. It doesn't matter that your religious preference is, or even if you are an unsaved heathen, these values work well in maintaining order and peace within a secular context. Yes, even unbelievers can have a good set of norms and standards and be model citizens. Well, guess what? God set it up that way. Marriage, family, and government are all three divine institutions established by God for the protection of society, believer and unbeliever alike. Without them, as the foundations of society, we have anarchy. Can they become corrupted? Yes, of course they can, especially government. But today, marriage and family are under extreme attack and are in danger of being destroyed. Destroy the family unit and you have huge social problems. The conscience often warns us of problems long before we're, we're able to reason why it's a problem. It tells us that something is wrong before we have a chance to rationalize it. The conscience does this from its previous training and conditioning about what is right and what is wrong. 
and makes application even in situations that are not clearly black and white. Even in those unclear gray situations, a well-developed conscience with a solid set of norms and standards will at least raise a red flag. The danger is that divine norms and standards can be corrupted and even completely replaced with demonic values. When that happens, the conscience becomes incapable of functioning as the tripwire of the soul because the standards it uses are distorted. The conscience no longer functions as God intended for it to function. Believers in this conviction reject divine truth found in scripture and they trade the truth for a lie. False becomes true, and truth becomes false. All we have to do is look around society today, and we see ample examples of that. Values are turned upside down, and in this situation, if it is true for the Christian, it is doubly true for the rest of society. Satan's objective is to break down the institutions that perpetuate the solid, even scriptural, norms and standards. In doing so, he can corrupt the norms and standards himself and substitute his own. Many believers are in a state of passivity of the conscience. They use satanic doctrines as their moral values and believe in their hearts they're doing right because Satan has convinced them that wrong is right. Their values are no longer divinely inspired. Their values are corrupted. It doesn't matter what a culture believes, there are indeed, it doesn't matter what a culture believes, there are indeed moral values that God never intended for society to change simply because society finds them inconvenient or limited. The society that rejects these truths is headed for destruction. God will not allow a society that has corrupted values to exist beyond certain limits. All of you have to do is look at history and you can see the truth of this. We're warned about this danger in passages like 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meals which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Seared with a hot iron in the Greek is the word katarizo, and it means to cauterize and by implication to render insensitive. The damaged conscience has scar tissue on it, and this scar tissue is insensitive in effect, rendering the conscience non-functioning in its tripwire function. Thus far, I have focused on moral issues, but the conscience has a trip, as a tripwire has application beyond moral issues. It is possible, in fact common, for the believer to be in a state of passivity of the conscience and still have a fairly solid set of moral values, but his doctrinal foundation is corrupted. His conscience is operating on a false set of doctrinal values, and he accepts non-scriptural practices as scriptural. Even when the Holy Spirit speaks to this person through God's people, he rejects the truth and continues in disobedience to God's will for him. Once false doctrines are allowed in the soul, they become the gateway to more false doctrines. The believer thus deceived, becomes passive in his spiritual life. And passive is just as bad as outright disobedience. He may be doing what he isn't producing for God because he is distracted into a non-scriptural activity. His witness is not false, is not only false, it is in opposition to God's plan. He is right where Satan wants him. The answer for the believer is in scripture in passages like these in Ephesians 4.17. 
This I say, therefore, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of your mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluding from the life of God, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. In Romans 12, too, we have this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That term renewing in Romans 12, too, carries the idea of renovation, taking what is corrupted and making it new again. The believer is called to reject what society often accepts and to live by a different standard, a divine standard. That does not happen simply because the believer wishes it so. It is the process, renewing, where the corrupted norms and standards accepted by the rest of society are exchanged for a new set of divine norms and standards. This process involves study, like this one. For the secular world and our nation at large, the problem is how to return to a set of solid moral values is far more complicated. It must, however, begin with the believer as the salt of the earth, but as a nation, we have gone too far to be able to turn back without a lot of pain being inflicted. If this country is to survive, a national conscience must be reestablished with sound, biblically-based norms and standards. I said biblically-based. That doesn't mean all society must become Christians, although that would be desirable. But it does mean enough of society has a solid set of moral values and holds the rest of society to that standard. Passivity of the human spirit. <clears throat> We've seen how Satan can induce a believer into a passive state through deception. He may actually think he is being productive or is operating under divine guidance when in fact he is well outside God's will for his life and is non-productive. Man's spirit can also be rendered passive. <clears throat> to understand... <clears throat> How the human spirit can be brought into a condition of passivity, we need to understand a little bit about the human spirit. Your human spirit is that part of you that was generated by the Holy Spirit at the new birth. It is what makes you a literal child of God. It is that part of you that has communication with God through the indwelling Holy Spirit. All right, first some review. <clears throat> Man is born dichotomous, being made up of a, two parts, a body and a soul. The soul is our mentality, our personality, and our intellect, your brain and all of its functions. These two are products of the human reproductive process. Some confuse the soul with the spirit and some translations fail to differentiate between the two, but they are two very different things. Man is not born with the human spirit. Your spirit is a product of divine generation. All right, let's take a look at a passage that clarifies this. John 3, 1 through 10. Lane, before you go to that, wouldn't you say that Adam and Eve had a human spirit? when they were created and they did converse with God. Yes. But it died with sin. Yes. Okay. So we're born with one, but it's still there, but it's dead. It's inoperative. That's but another thing. You're born again. This, and frankly, I can, I can go either way on it. The yeah. scripture seems to allude to a birth, a creation of a spirit rather than a rebirth of the spirit. But like I said, I'm comfortable with either. Um, okay. I am too. Yeah. The point's still the same. Um, yeah. You have no ability to communicate with God, whether your spirit is dead or non-existent. Yes. Um, until uh, regeneration. 
All right. On this John 3, 1 through 10 passage, he said, here we have a dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Jesus tell, tells Nicodemus, in order to enter the kingdom, he must be born again. In more modern vernacular, this process Jesus spoke of is also referred to as regeneration. The term can be a bit confusing but it can, because it seems to suggest a rebirth, and that may not be completely accurate. It is referring to, referred to it elsewhere as the new man or the new creation. Nicodemus is understandably confused and Jesus tells him in verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The body and the soul are born of the flesh, but the human spirit is born of the spirit. The unbeliever does not possess a human spirit or if he does, that human spirit is considered dead. He has no need of one because it's through the human spirit that we have commun communion with God and the unbeliever is without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That's from Ephesians 2. See also 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 15 for a reference to the spirit of man working in harmony with the spirit of God and how the natural man unsaved cannot comprehend spiritual issues. There is no divinely generated human spirit and no indwelling Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.10. These things God has revealed to us through the spirit. For the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts, even the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might understand the things freely given to us, and we impart these in words not taught by human wisdom, but through the spirit but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no, no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct them, but we have the mind of Christ. As a believer, you can be driven by your body, your soul, or your human spirit. Pick one. Because only one can be in the driver's seat. And guess which one is supposed to be behind the wheel? The human spirit is supposed to be controlling the soul and the body doing so in harmony with the Holy Spirit and God's will. If your spirit is passive, that is your soul or your body is in the driver's seat, you will not be led by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit leading is effectively blocked by the human spirit not being in control of the man. Passivity of the spirit is the paralyzing of the human spirit and can come about in a number of different ways. Here are a few. Ignorance of how the spirit functions. If the believer is ignorant of the fact he even has a human spirit and or how it functions, and many are, then he will often be driven by the soulish nature of bodily need or bodily needs. The spiritual life is non-functioning. You can have wrong mental conclusions or wrong thought from mixed up feelings such as physical, soulish, or spiritual, and not knowing which is which can cause confusion. Is it your body talking to you, your sin nature, or your spirit? Drawing upon the soulish life instead of the spirit, are you being led by the sin nature instead of your spirit in cooperation with the Holy Spirit? Your mind can read your five senses very well. Your mind ought to be able to read your spirit as well. When your spirit is telling you something, your mind ought to be able to sense that 
just like it senses input from the five senses. If it cannot, your input may be from your sin nature and not from your spirit and thus not from God. Worry or trouble over the past or future checks the free operations of the spirit and makes the outer man and outer affairs dominant over the spirit. The spirit becomes locked up, so to speak. Exhaustion of the body and mind are often the means that Satan uses to gain access to your human spirit. Haven't you been so exhausted physically or stressed mentally to the part, point that you can't even think? You become numb. That's an extreme example of what I'm talking about, but it can become dangerous to your individual, your spiritual life, long before you reach the point of exhaustion, when your mind just wants to shut down. I experienced this one day, with my, the day of my dad's funeral. I just became totally, completely exhausted. And I had to drive home from my mother's house, which is six blocks. I barely made it. When you become so preoccupied with life and getting by that it dominates your thinking, you're shifting, you're shutting out the function of your spirit and your relationship with God. Satan wants you highly stressed and focused on the stress. We're called to use our free will and our intellect and think with doctrine. That is kind of hard to do when you're exhausted or under stress. The military, police, firemen, all work under extremely stressful and physical exhaust, physically exhausting conditions. Their actions, even when exhausted or under stress, must be correct and must be automatic or someone gets hurt or dies. This is why they train so hard. So even under stress and exhaustion, they will respond in the appropriate manner. And this is why you, as a believer, must learn doctrine, how to apply it, and why you will get tested in its use. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. And Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The danger is we will let our soulish needs or bodily needs consume our attention and get us focused inwardly. When that happens, the human spirit is no longer in control of the person. His sin nature or some bodily need or lust is controlling the person. That is what passivity of the spirit looks like. And that state completely destroys the immediate and personal relationship the believer has with God through his human spirit. Sadly, many believers are in a passive state and are completely aware, unaware of it. Passivity of the whole person. These passive conditions we've been looking at have one more level. They can reach a point where the believer becomes completely passive and completely ineffective for God and his plan. At this stage, every part of the person is being affected. One version of this is Satan appealing to that part of our sin nature that has a tendency towards asceticism. Now, asceticism is the human tendency to personal sacrifice on an extreme level. It is practicing extreme self-denial in pursuit of a religious experience. This is from a misinterpretation of Colossians 2.23. If you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, these people who tend to be ascetics draw from the, withdraw from the world because they see it as evil. As Christians, we're told not to be of this world, but we are charged with going out to the whole world in the Great Commission. The ascetics I'm speaking of aren't a bunch of homeschoolers. They become hermits. 
and give up food and drink and even basic hygienic practices. They reject these things as indulgences of the flesh. The monastic system of the early church appealed to this side of man. These people separated themselves from society and gave their lives to prayer and self-denial. I'm not speaking of the call to total surrender here. That is abandoning ourselves to God where the believer places his will in harmony with the will of God. This is far more severe and a distortion of that principle. The problem with asceticism is often motivation. People do this because they see it as a means of gaining the approbation of God. If it is in any expectation of blessing, they are deceived into a passive condition. If you think you can do something, anything that will cause God to bless you, you can't. This concept of blessing for religious, for righteous behavior, that is recompense, and cursing for unrighteous behavior, retribution, is a false doctrine. At one time, Israel was under such a marriage system called the Law of Moses. God made a covenant with a particular group of people, Israel, and promised certain blessings if they obeyed and certain discipline if they did not. But that was Israel under the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace, according to Romans. There are natural reaping what you sow consequences of our behavior, good or bad, and that is a divinely divine designed system. Everything in this world comes from God. It is his to give or withhold. Look around you, and you'll see very unrighteous people blessed enormously, and a lot of very righteous people poor as a church mouth. And you will see the righteous suffer, and the unrighteous die unhappy, die happy. This is because God doesn't use a merit system to bless people, at least not under the grace system, which is we are under today. The flip side of this is an appeal to the lascivious side of our sin nature. The person becomes gluttonous in the demand for the supply of his bodily needs, his body, and its desires dominate the soul. Men can live in the realm of the human spirit or the body or the soul. Living in the realm and control of the human spirit is called spiritual because it is in harmony with the leading of the spirit of God. Living in the realm and power of the soul is what we call soulish or carnal. This person is driven by his sin nature. This person is often deeply involved in mental attitude sins because he's looking to satisfy psychological needs through thinking himself superior to others. It's an easy trap to fall into. There is a subset of this soulish man where the person is completely dominated by their bodies. Physical lust, be it food, drink, Physical pleasure of some sort or sex becomes their motivation for living. One extreme can manifest itself in obesity. Another extreme can be those driven by a need for physical fitness. In either case, bodily needs take priority over everything they do. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that everyone who is out of shape and every person who is in the physical fitness is in passivity of the body. I know wonderful and spiritual Christians who are overweight and others who are very much into physical fitness. But they need to be careful because they are particularly susceptible to this deception. This should not be construed that the Christian is to neglect bodily needs or physical fitness and a healthy lifestyle. It's just a warning of the danger that this can become a consuming passion to the point that it dominates the life to the neglect of God and God's plan for the believer. The question is, what will dominate your life? God would prefer you to live in the spirit, a living sacrifice and testimony against Satan. 
Satan would prefer you to be a slave to your sin nature or your body. A believer deceived by evil spirits will tend to live in a state dominated by his sin nature or his body. Either way, you are passive towards God and God's plan and a non-functioning Christian. The things of God are either distorted into false doctrine or simply put aside. And what you get is spiritual apathy. The Christian is brought to a condition where he is dull to spiritual things. Yet at the same time, he may be keenly aware of social or worldly elements around him. That should be a wake-up call that something is wrong with your relationship with God. All right, the perils of this passivity. The believer is never called to anything resembling a passive state. We are always called to use our free wills to decide for God and his plan as revealed to us. He desires to surrender to his will by active choice to do his will, and it may be as it may be revealed to us. God requires for his working cooperation with his spirit and the complete use of every faculty of the whole person. Therein is the danger of passivity. You are in passivity of the will if you have failed to use your will to choose for God. Are you in some way deceived and thinking it doesn't matter? I don't have to use my will. It's all God's will anyway. Whatever happens will happen. That, my friend, is passivity of the will. Do you think you're doing God's will when in fact you're busy doing what you want or more accurately what Satan wants? Your free will is God given and he expects you to use it. To put your will in a passive state is to open yourself to any kind of leading by unclean spirits. Your will is one of the most important elements of the angelic conflict. And there is an expectation that you will use it. Have you given up because you aren't smart enough for this? That's passivity of the mind. God can't really use me. I'm too dumb. Just keep feeding me milk. That's all I can handle. I don't want any meat. Please, no tough doctrines where I have to really think about it. Don't make me have to figure this out. If that's your attitude, then you have placed your intellect into a passive state. You are called to use your mind to reason, examine, and test. Failing to do so is to assume all that comes at you is divine in nature, and we know that's not always true. When should we assume? Never. Satan should prefer, would prefer it if the believer never examined anything. Just pass it on through. This is an open door to unclean spirits. This is a classic failing of many believers in many denominations. They have become conditioned to receive whatever the authority they have set up delivers. But often that authority is an unclean spirit or a person deceived by one. Once you have sucked this stuff in, you have another problem, error that must be dealt with. Have you closed your mind to spiritual arguments? Certain that you know in your heart and all this Bible study stuff is just a lot of baloney. This is just a bunch of fairy tales and hocus pocus. Who can believe all this stuff is really true or more common among believers? You know this doctrine, or that doctrine is correct, but refuse to acknowledge scriptural evidence or teaching that clearly and biblically are in conflict with what you think you know. Then your judgment and reason are in a passive state. Refusal to correct error despite efforts by the Holy Spirit through God's people will lead to hardness of the heart, scar tissue, and more false doctrines. 
The longer the truth is rejected, the deeper the believer is drawn into deception and the more difficult it is to get him out. When something is presented to you, you best give it a thorough hearing. Use your mind and doctrine and determine if your closely held theology is really true or is it indeed an error. I've come to a change of heart about several doctrines. The Holy Spirit worked on my heart and presented the truth to me. I waited against the word, prayed about it, and changed my theology as a result. Obviously, you must use scripture and sound doctrine as a guide. Passivity of judgment or reason will not allow this. I'm right, and nothing you can say will change my mind. That's arrogance and a hostile mindset of the truth, and it is digging your grave just a bit deeper. 2 Timothy 4.3 for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap on themselves teachers having itching ears. Sound in the Greek means healthy or figuratively uncorrupt. The idea is that some doctrine is healthy for your spiritual life and some is not. Those suffering from passivity of reason or judgment reject what is healthy for them in favor of what is unhealthy. Are you so open to supernatural reasonings that no warning bells ever go off? God has said, so I must follow at all costs. That's true if God did indeed say it, but you ought to be sure it was from God. The conscience is God-given. It will warn you of things long before your intellect will, but it can become corrupted with false teaching, delivered as deceptions by unclean spirits. It can also be rendered, rendered inoperative through the suggestion that you don't need it by those same unclean spirits. They will suggest to you, just listen to the leadings of God. Of course, it will make you think it's from God when it really is from Satan. Your conscience is a tripwire for danger, but once it's shut down as unneeded and become passive or is corrupted with false doctrines, it becomes unreliable. What was false becomes true, and what was once true is false. Or the believer simply ignores his warnings in favor of these supernatural leadings. Many believers are caught up in this very deception. If the tripwire is not working, you are receptive to false teachings because there is not that small voice in your head saying, wait a minute, are you in tune with yourself and not your spirit? Are you a slave to your body, led by it? A slave to your sin nature and led by it? Are you so intent on getting by day by day, making a living, so stressed that you're more attuned to the physical than the spiritual? Have you shut out your spirit? Have you put your spirit into neutral, rendered it passive? It's easy to do. In this process, you choose yourself, you close yourself off from the Holy Spirit and any leading from God. Remember, your soulish nature, theological satisfactions, your body needs, exhaustion, stress, and lust, or your human spirit can be in control of the person at any time. Pick one. And it better be your human spirit, because if your spirit is shut out of the process, the Holy Spirit cannot lead you, and you will not be in the will of God. Those caught in this often cannot get free without a severe shock to get their attention. Even then, if the person is far enough gone, that may not work. Have you reached the extreme where the person begins shutting down and becoming dysfunctional? These people have damaged relationships. They burn bridges, are irritable, easy to anger, lose control, develop irritating habits. Has Satan so succeeded in distorting your perspective that you have problems with relationships? Is a person on the extreme 
It, this is the person on the extreme and close to psychosis. They have built up massive amounts of scar tissue. They have a damaged conscience, increased blindness, and an intensified disturbance of the soul and spiritual unrest that requires great effort to suppress. This person is a casualty in the angelic conflict. And his chances of recovering from his wounds are not good. Be honest. I bet every one of you could see yourself somewhere in one of these descriptions. And that's not an accusation or a judgment. What I mean is this is more common than most of us realize. It doesn't always take on its most extreme form. I know what many of you are thinking. This isn't going to happen to me. I submit to you, not only will it happen to you, it more than likely already has. You just failed to recognize it and hopefully recovered. The only question is, at what level have you been deceived into a passive or unproductive state? What charge ought to shake you to the core? Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Grain is agitated or sifted in a fan or sieve to separate the wheat from the chaff, the husk. The grain remains in the fan and the lighter chaff and dust are blown off. Christ says that Satan desired to try Peter to place trials and temptations before him, to see whether anything of faith would remain or whether all that would be found would be chafe. Will he only talk the talk or walk the walk? How about you? When Satan sifts you like we, what will your reaction be? Out of this comes a slide into destruction. There is a pattern that the believer often follows once trapped in passivity and deceived by Satan. This pattern represents a spiral into destruction as the believer's failed spiritual life becomes not a testimony for God, but one for Satan. It begins with disobedience. It may be willful, or it may be that the believer was deceived into merely thinking he was doing God's will. God's will. In either case, the believer is held accountable for his fall from grace. Adam sinned, and he knew it, whereas Eve was deceived, but both were held accountable. This first failure opens the door to Satan and his lies. Once in disobedience, the believer becomes highly susceptible to Satan's deceptions. In a condition of passivity and having brought into the lies of Satan, the believer often has a second problem, and that is the refusal to correct error because despite efforts by the Holy Spirit through God's people, that's passivity of the reason or judgment in full bloom. The believer becomes hardened in his belief and in the lie and refuses any efforts by believers to correct his doctrinal error. The truth from the word of God is presented, ignored, and rejected. This is often accompanied by the rejection of biblical authorities, such as pastors or evangelists or others in authority. This is further hardening of passivity or reason or judgment. If true doctrines are rejected, then the authority presenting the doctrines must also be rejected. What follows is, by necessity, self-justification. This is driven by pride. In this condition, the believer's mind is not only completely closed to the truth, but he begins the process of justifying and vigorously defending his deceived condition. At this point, we often have the onset of significant levels of influence by unclean spirits to deceive. This is very often accompanied by visions of the deceased or even biblical persons such as Jesus or Mary. I believe demon influence 
could be an issue from the first stage. And here the doors are thrown open and it intensifies. There is no scriptural evidence to support visions and dreams in this age. There are few instances recorded in the apostolic period of the New Testament, but only a few, such as the conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus. There is nothing in the New Testament to indicate this is normal for this age. There is the adoption of arrogance or hostility as a mindset. Hostility to the truth and those with the truth as hardness of heart decrease, increases. Scar tissue builds up, rendering recovery from more difficult because it's harder for the truth to penetrate. There is the substitution of unscriptural doctrines and practices and the deceived believer becomes an active voice for false teaching and error. Severe damage is done to the conscience. And as a result of the failure of the tripwire of the soul being corrupted, spiritual blindness increases. This creates a vacuum for the conscience and na na nature abhors a vacuum. That vacuum therefore sucks in even more error and the conscience is further corrupted and even more false doctrines are accepted as true. Once the believer reaches this point, there is an increased disturbance in the mind and the spirit, requiring greater effort to suppress. There is an onset of serious psychological problems often characterized by major conflicts in interpersonal relations. I'm not saying all psychological disorders are the result of deception or passivity. Many or indeed physiological in origin, but many are not. Secular psychology rarely recognizes the existence of the latter, but is no less real. Once the believer begins this slide, the spiritual norm of divine production is no longer happening, and in some cases even impossible. They may think they are doing the work of God, but in fact, they are into asceticism, denying themselves worldly things because they are corrupting. Or they may lean towards altruism, doing his best for God, but it is for nothing because it is all based on corrupted and false doctrines. Some good may come of it. That is, some may actually benefit, but the underlying motivation is demonically inspired to assuage the deceiving deceived believer's own arrogance. This condition is exactly that of the Pharisees of Jesus' day when he described them as like whitewashed tomb. Look pretty on the outside, but there's nothing but a rotting corpse of the spiritual dead person inside. The believer is never called to anything resembling a passive state. We are always called to use our free wills to decide for God and his plan as revealed to us. God desires to surrender to his will by active choice to do his will as it may be revealed to us. He requires for his working cooperation with his spirit and the complete use of every faculty of the whole person. Oswald Chambers puts it this way in his little devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. This is the September 8th entry. He says this, The warfare is not against sin. Jesus Christ conquered that in his redemption of us. The conflict is waged over turning our natural life into a spiritual life. This is never done easily nor does God intend that it be so. It is accomplished only through a series of moral choices. God does not make us holy in the sense that he makes our character holy. He makes us holy in the sense that he makes us innocent before him. And then we have to turn that innocence into holy character through the moral choices that we make. And I think that's the end of the lesson for this week. Um, anybody have any thoughts or comments? 
It's a little yeah. deep, deep stuff. <laughs> what was that? You said that was some deep, deep <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I'm hard of hearing. I have kind of a sidebar thing there that crossed my mind, uh, Lane. When you were talking about people in which pastors and evangelists and spiritual authority, well, that what what authority do they have? I don't know how else to word this over us. I mean, I'm a believer, and I'm in a church, and there's my pastor, and I, I I don't know what I'm really trying to say. I'm not trying to make a statement, but I'm. It's like as we mature, do they have less authority over us, or, or what what authority do they have? That's a good question. You have true authorities and you have false authorities. I would Do say. Do they have an authority so much as a responsibility? Yeah, and they have authority in as much as we delegate that authority to them. Right. Okay. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, we should be submitting ourselves to an authority on scripture, for example someone who teaches and we should be attending a church where the pastor has um not just preach but he actually teaches something uh that you can you can use and what i'm encountering a lot and my experience is limited of course is that there are many churches that they preach they say do this and don't do that but they don't really tell you the mechanics of how all that works. You don't really understand the background of it. You don't really understand the um, integrity of God and what the integrity of God expects because they've probably never taught that or they've taught it, they've taught it in very simplistic terms. Um, so yeah, we should be submitting to authorities that um, can teach us and lead us and guide us um, but there's, of course, a risk in that, in that these may not be legitimate authorities. Um, I think when most of the times I was using that term authority in this lesson tonight, I was referring to <clears throat> people who submit to church authorities that really they should not be submitting to that their authority is not legitimate and um, their authority is based on false doctrines. And a, a lot of us encounter that. And there are a lot of denominations out there that are based on false teachings. <clears throat> and they establish an authority over their parishioners and that, far, that authority is dangerous. Does that make any sense? Or did I just ramble? <laughs> well, you know, they God gave us pastors and teachers. Uh, that's absolutely necessary initially, but I think we need to outgrow that to where we begin to learn mm -hmm. on our own. Absolutely. They've made graphs of spiritual growth in versus years in church, and it's a flat line. And if that's all you're getting is from the pastor, uh, it's it's still milk, and you should be on on meat by this time. Mm -hmm. You can outgrow that and develop your own authority because we become pastors and teachers eventually to other people. Guys, I got a hard stop. I got to jump. Y'all have a great day. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Great All right. Day. Yeah. You're right, Barry. Um, there are other sources for spiritual growth besides just church on Sunday and Bible study on Wednesday night or whatever. Um <clears throat> There are lots of material out there, that, um, books and whatnot, and there's, there's good Bible software out there. I, I use one called Lagos, which is used in many seminaries today, and it's amazing how that can help your development in doing your own studies and looking at words and looking at passages and various commentaries, and then trying to compare that doctrines and and develop your own system your own uh, way of learning 
um, that is not totally dependent on someone else. <clears throat> the only way you learn is to teach. And if you're going to teach, you better be secure in what you believe. Yeah. Well, and I, I think the scripture is pretty clear that we are to test everything. Yes. You know, and it's if we're going to church and we're listening to a pastor, I'm, and I'm not saying this in, in that it's true in all cases, but a, a pastor is a lot of times there for a 30 minute sermon to boost the people up to bring people into the, the church, to get them participating. And that's not wrong, but that's not leading you to where you need to be with God. And you shouldn't be trusting everything that pastor says. You should be testing it. And the way you test it is exactly what you're saying. You test it by going to scripture. You test it by participating in Bible studies. You test it by doing your own research. You know, we follow, <clears throat> he's now deceased, Dr. Chuck Missler. Uh, and he comes at it from a different way, but he starts off all of his teaching by never take what I say is true. Always do, do the research for yourself and come to your own conclusion. And that's the danger that we take is when we're listening to someone of authority, Dennis, and we're taking it as, <clears throat> as ultimate truth because they're more trained than we are. They got a doctorate in theology. They have this. And so we feel inferior to them and that we should take them as truth. And scripture says, no, you shouldn't. You should be testing that against your own Holy Spirit, coming to your own conclusions and not the conclusions of what somebody's trying to present you, though they may be accurate. They may, may not be. Dave, I agree with you. We have the Holy Spirit, and he's the ultimate teacher. Yeah, right. What got me, what, what made me think was the word authority, like a, a policeman or somebody has authority. Would, like Lane said, it's an authority we actually give them. You know, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, as Dave was saying, um, we need to test everything. We don't don't trust any teacher one hundred percent because there's none of us that are perfect, and we we get things wrong. I have changed my theology over the years on on some subjects. <clears throat> I'm in the process of looking at a subject right now, which um, I think we as believers have come to accept as correct and I think that we may be wrong in accepting this little tidbit I'll get to it later I'm not going to go into it right now but I, I think we're misinterpreting um, a word a very important word that we encounter in the Bible and I think we're, we're giving meaning to it that's not really there but that's another subject for another time you're leaving us hanging and I've been telling us the word <laughs> Amen. Teaser. Um, that's a teaser alert. <laughs> I, 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 I've not come to hard conclusions yet about the word, but I've suspected a problem with the word for some time. I've been doing some preliminary research into it and how it's used and rationalizing its use this way, what the implications are, and the words repent. Okay. Good deal. Okay, I guess that's it for today. Thank you, everyone, for your participation, for your questions and your comments, which helps all of us. Um, so I'll close with a prayer. Thank you, Father, for the time that you've given us to explore your word. Thank you for your spirit that teaches and guides and leads us. Help us to maintain our focus on your spirit and not on our physical bodies or our soulish nature. Uh, help us through this week that we might be witnesses for you in Satan's world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.